In this video, we're going to do a quick overview of how the age of imperialism affected China. And as you'll see, it's a little bit different from imperialism in Africa. It's a little bit different from imperialism in the Middle East. And you'll also be able to compare uh, in the next video how China was different from Japan. But nonetheless, China, like many other places in the world, almost every place in the world, uh, in this time period experienced the effects of European imperialism. So, just a brief history to catch up. Uh, China is one of the oldest civilizations in the world. It's one of the oldest continual civilizations in the world. Um, it goes back about 2,000 years at least, probably 5,000, if you really want to count the entire Chinese civilization um, from start to now. Uh, its first contact with Europeans in a significant way happened during the Middle Ages. We think very often of Marco Polo. He wasn't the first and he wasn't the only one to travel the Silk Road, uh, but he's certainly the most famous for it. But trading with Europe through the Silk Road uh, was a very lucrative business on both sides during the uh, Middle Ages and Renaissance time periods. Um, and China was led by many powerful dynasties of ruling families. We think of the Ming Dynasty as the most famous at the time. Um, but China was a dynastic empire, meaning that uh, it was ruled by families that would hold the crown for many generations before handing it over to a different family. So in that sense, it had a lot in common with the dynasties um, and ruling families of Europe at this time period. And as we know, China has very strong traditions and culture, some of which are uh, very old and still exist today. Confucianism, for example, um, has been around for a long time uh, and is still a part of Chinese culture today. Confucian ideals are still ingrained in the, uh, the national fabric of the People's Republic of China. So China was conquered by the Mongols in the 1200s. In fact, the Great Wall of China, which is the only man-made structure visible from space. A little trivia there. Uh, the Great Wall of China was created to try to keep the Mongols out from invading. And When I visited the Great Wall of China, what I was amazed by is not so much the height, uh, but the placement that they put it through these rigorous parts of the mountains so that just getting up to the wall itself was difficult for an army, let alone then getting over the wall that would have uh, soldiers protecting it and shooting arrows at you from the top. So it's a very impressive structure. Check it out if you're ever in China. Uh, the Ming Dynasty was the famous Chinese ruling dynasty, um, and the Ming was overrun by the Qing Dynasty, uh, or Qing Dynasty, which was from Manchuria and ruled uh, all the way through the era of imperialism. They would be the last dynasty in charge of China. And here is an imperial China Chinese flag. So Europeans will make their way to China during the age of imperialism, just like they make their way to all these other regions we studied. China was a fairly strong country and didn't need to trade uh, with Europe more than Europe needed China. Uh, China was pretty good with agriculture, especially in the, uh, the coastal area of China. In fact, only one third of China, most of China's population lives 80% uh, or so, just in one third of the country. It's a large country, but most of the people live uh, in the coastal area. Um, of China, and that's very, very fertile for agriculture. So they were agricultural, um, very self-sufficient at this time. They had about 300 million people living in China by the year 1800. So it was one of the largest countries in the world. It, it, it's the largest country today, and uh, China and India were the two largest countries uh, in the world in the 1800s as well. Um, China didn't want to trade much with Europe because they were pretty self-sufficient. They had what they needed. Um, so they really originally only allowed Europe to trade in Canton as just one port. But if you give a mouse a cookie, they will dominate you uh, economically. So when does China really run into their first problem with Europe during the age of imperialism? Well, Europe began to trade opium in China. They basically would take the, op the poppy seeds, uh, grow them in Afghanistan and Pakistan and India, convert them to opium, which would be, uh, it, it's an opiate class of drugs. It's not very popular today. It's very popular in the 19th century, highly addictive. It'd be like Oxycontin today, for example. Um, but they would convert the poppies to opium and then sell that opium to the Chinese market. Um, this creates a lot of problems in China. It's not necessarily that 300 million people get addicted to opium, but the rich, noble class of China struggles with opium addiction. And just like any other drug addiction, what you can often see here is that when you run out of money to fuel the addiction, uh, you need to find it from somewhere else. And that can lead to theft um, and robbery. In China, the noble class was actually using tax money from the people, the peasants who didn't have much to give. Instead of putting that back into the country, they were spending it on opium. Um, so 
This is obviously creating many problems in China, and the emperor of China at the time tries to ban the opium trade. Um, the problem with that is that Great Britain and France as well stand to lose a lot of money if that trade is closed. So Great Britain uh, goes to war at sea with China, and this is called the Opium War of 1839. China's navy had not been modernized. Great Britain has the best navy in the world. It's industrial. Uh, China's navy is no match, and they're forced to surrender uh, to the British very easily, and they are also forced to sign a treaty which opens up the ports. And this is an interesting picture I took when I was in China. Uh, this is the old summer palace. Uh, the emperor at the time was very close with the Europeans that were in China, um, benefited greatly from their trade, he did, and uh, he actually had his summer palace designed by an Italian architect, so there were Roman columns and it was very European style uh, in appearance. As a way to send a message during the Opium Wars, the British and the French destroyed that palace, and today you can go visit it uh, and see the ruins of the palace, and they actually reconstructed a, a garden maze um, that you can walk through, and we, we raced through it. It was pretty fun. So, after the Opium War of 1839, opium is now freely traded in China, uh, and the people of China are very upset. They feel like their emperor is not doing enough to resist the corruption uh, and negative influence of the Europeans through their trade and imperialism. So the Taiping Rebellion breaks out in China, and not a lot of people realize this, but the Taiping Rebellion goes on for about 30 years. It claims 20 million lives, right? Think of this, we, we roughly guessed about 6 million people uh, died in the Holocaust, for example, during World War II, and we lose 20 million lives in China over the 30 years in the Taiping Rebellion. So this is a, this is a big world history event that doesn't often get brought up uh, in Western civilization classes. Um, and the people of China are very um, resistant to modernizing because they are upset about the corruption and the negative influence that the West brings with this uh, imperialism and, and their imperial practices. So they also resent the ways of the West, including modernization and industrialization. Um, unfortunately, that has a downside. It's, it's hard to uh, break away from the control and the dominance of uh, Western countries when you are not industrialized like they are. So, foreign influence only gets uh, tighter and tighter, and, and the pressure increases on China. There's a second opium war in 1857 to force more opium trade uh, with Britain and France. They tried to limit the trade of opium, and not even that was okay. So in 1857, we go to war again over opium. Uh, the Russians take Manchuria from China, the northeastern portion of China, interestingly enough, where the Qing Dynasty originated from. They take Manchuria from China because they see that the territory is right next door and China is very weak at this point. Um, Japan takes territory from China. They annex the uh, Korean Peninsula, which was under Chinese rule at the time. Again, they're building an empire, as we'll see in the next video. China is weak. It's a slam dunk. Um, and China, although it's not officially a colony of any country, uh, is forced to practice the open door policy, which was the idea actually of John Hay, the secretary of state for the United States because the U.S. wanted to be able to trade in Asia, um, expand their influence in Asia, and they were a little bit late to the imperialism game, so they, they get everybody on board uh, to force China into the open door policy, which lets China stay independent. It's not a colony of any country, with a few exceptions of ports like Hong Kong and Macau, but it gives all its trade rights to the United States and Europe. And that leads us to this map here where we see spheres of influence, areas where foreign countries dominated uh, certain parts of China when it came to trading rights. For example, this sphere of influence right here is where Great Britain had uh, all the say over trading rights in ports like Hangzhou and Shanghai right here, all the way to Chongqing uh, in the interior of China. Down in the Guangzhou district or Canton, Hong Kong was actually annexed by Great Britain. Macau was annexed by Portugal, but this whole area down here you can see was under French influence. And then we see similar situations here. Japan annexes Korea completely, but also has a sphere of influence in part of Manchuria. Russia takes part of Manchuria over here. Um, so it's just, you, you see that although China was not technically a colony of any of these countries, it was severely limited and dominated by these countries. So we're starting to see in this example that imperialism, you don't have to take a colony directly to uh, be influencing and practicing imperialism on another country. So the rebellions continue. There is a martial arts cult called the Society of Righteous and Harmonious Fists. They decide to rid China of the foreign devils. 
Um, so they start ambushing and attacking Christian missionaries. They believed that their martial uh, arts skills were able to have supernatural powers and resist the bullets of the Westerners. Of course, this isn't going to work, um, but many, many other people jump in to join them, uh, and this starts what's called the Boxer Rebellion, and it's named after the, the group that started the rebellion. But the British and French have to put this down because their people, their missionaries, their traders and things like that are being uh, attacked during the Boxer Rebellion. Um, and with all the strife and all the problems, the Chinese people demand in 1911 a constitution uh, to limit the power of the emperor, showing that they're not happy with the emperor's inability to resist Western influence in China. And then in 1919, at the end of World War I, they'll overthrow the emperor completely. So that is how China was dominated uh, during the age of imperialism. It's interesting. They were never formally a colony of any of these countries, but they certainly experienced imperialism just like many of the other regions that we've studied so far.